Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't have any special announcements. I want to just quickly ask, do you have any questions about anything? Okay, so next week, before I go into a new topic, next week, uh, we are going to also talk about multilingual large language models. Um, and for that, I wanted to try something a little bit um, different. So first of all, can I, if you if you speak a language that's not English, uh, if you feel like you're fluent in uh, any other language than English, can you raise your hand? Right, Let's see. Four, one, two, three. Okay, you cancel. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, six, seven, eight. Okay, we can participate as well. Uh, all right, so, and sorry, can you raise a hand if you do not speak other uh, language than English? One, two, three, four, five. Wait, you had a raised hand for speaking English or not? Uh, okay, okay, good, good, good. All right, so um, there is a few of you who don't speak other languages. What I was thinking, we can try some of these uh, multilingual language models and try to play around them with them in other languages. Uh, so some of you who do speak other languages are going to do that. And then if you do not speak other language, we are going to try something else. So when we are done with the lecture today, um, I'm going to raise this, uh, however this is called, and you, you're going to write what languages uh, do you do you speak. Uh, this will help me prepare for the uh, session. So if you do speak other language than English, please stick around after the lecture. Come here and we'll just write it down here. I will take a photo and then I can uh, prepare for the lecture. Is that clear? It's a little bit funky, so no worries if you're confused. Okay. Uh, seems like you're all fine. Okay, so let's move forward. Um, last time I wanted to finish with um, uh, with um, a relation extraction, and I have only two slides relating to this. We won't go into um, you know any kinds of details. I just want to introduce this task for you, to you. So the task is to find and classify semantic relationships among entities mentioned in text. For example, child of relation means that if you find an entity X and I in your text, you want to predict whether X um, is the child of I. Um, and there are whole other kinds of relations. Um, uh, here I, I use something that's a, maybe a little bit more um, understandable, but very often people do this in biomedical domain as well, where you have a relationship within different molecules or, you know, things that can react uh, with each other. And uh, when people were doing this, uh, then you would have these pieces of text, you would collect these relationships, and then you can build the knowledge graphs. So for example, imagine from Wikipedia, you can build a knowledge graph where you have all people that are mentioned in Wikipedia. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Yeah. We have a very active student called Thierry. I don't know what you mean by. Please. We have a very active student. <laughs> okay. Should see. Yes. Uh, let me see. How do you turn it off? I never, I didn't even know. I what... found this on the web. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Hopefully he won't react again. If, if it does, uh, we'll, we'll find a way to turn it off. Um, <clears throat> so what I was saying is that uh, imagine from Wikipedia, you have people and then people, for example, they are born in certain place. So you have a relationship born in and then a relationship between a person and a location. So you can build uh, these kinds of uh, information and place them uh, in a graph structure. So, um, and um, uh, here is just one example of how you can go about this. This is in this specific data set called, um, I don't know even how to pronounce this, but tech red maybe, uh, where given a sentence, the task is uh, you are given one uh, span, which is uh, the span uh, where subject is, and then the other span where the object of the sentence is. And the task is to predict the relation between them from 42 predefined relation tasks, and this is a a uh, pretty standard, um, you know, formulation of the of the task. And then with, uh, let's say, BERT, you would just uh, kind of, um, what people do is replace the actual words that were 
in a in a subject with subject person kind of the tag and here object location and person and location come from named entity recognition and then uh, you're just trying to do uh, basically multi-classification where you have 42 classes what's more interesting i think is this idea that i briefly mentioned last time uh, language models as knowledge bases the issue with knowledge bases is they are sparse um, you have we have so much knowledge uh, in the world and populating all this knowledge has always been uh, an issue so the goal um, for years was just to make knowledge bases more complete and that's really really hard um, and once um, you know pre-trained language models had um, came to the scene I mentioned last time that in their parameters implicitly uh, facts are stored. So we didn't train the model to remember these facts, but to predict what the next world is, it is useful for a model to know a certain facts. And we pre-trained all language models on Wikipedia because it's the, uh, you know, the source of more or less high quality text. Um, so first it was recognized that language models can capture this. So people have tried to also make them even better for uh, kind of constructing these knowledge bases. So here is an example of a common sense knowledge base where you want to have um, here, for example, X gets, uh, gets uh, X car repaired uh, before X needs what, what X would need uh, before getting their car repaired. Um, so to build this kind of common sense knowledge base, it's also important to recognize that uh, we all have common sense knowledge, but uh, of the like that's written here, but we don't explicitly say it. Remember when I was talking about about, the, about Vinograd schema challenge, I said this is not something we write, and therefore it might be you know something that's hard to, harder to uh, capture automatically. However, it has been shown that even the language models do capture some and uh, common sense to some extent. However, to uh, to you know get generations alike if you prompt a model x, x gets x car repaired before x needs and if you want to have a good completion here it has been shown that the first you can collect some of these set of seed uh, completions from people and then fine-tune a language model with these completions and then use that language model to get more of these inferences and in this way you are populating your knowledge base so for uh, this uh, this uh, atomic comet common sense knowledge base has been created in this fashion. And it's just a very interesting, I think, shift in how we do knowledge bases these days that language models themselves are what we use to create uh, a knowledge base rather than using the knowledge base to have better models, which was something people have, uh, you know, be doing before pre-trained language models. Okay, so just wanted to share this with you without going into a ton of details. Um, are there any questions about this? Otherwise, I'm gonna move to uh, a completely new topic. Okay, yeah, I think this is a very, very cool uh, result. So, um, you know, don't forget about it. All right, so um, today we're gonna talk about our other application. So moving away from question answering to summarization. Um, and ooh, this is, this shouldn't be here. <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's go over summarization by looking at uh, an example. The goal of summarization, I think you all can imagine, given some document or a collection of document to try to produce summary of that uh, document or collection of documents. Here, yesterday, I retrieved one of the documents on NPR's web page, um, which says uh, something about uh, Boeing's whistleblower uh, raising another issue. So what I want to do is let's do an exercise where we are going to read this article, and you're going to tell me which information you think is important to include in a final uh, summary. So um, that this is going to be two, uh, we will have two pages here and just maybe, um, read it. And then wh whenever you feel there is something important, just say it out loud, or if you feel more comfortable, raise a hand and then, um, uh, read it out loud. Okay. 
or maybe I can read it and you can tell me whether that's, in, that's something you would include. So Washington federal regulators are investigating a whistleblower's claims about flows in the assembly of Boeing's 787 Dreamliner. Important? Yeah. Okay. Is that that's important or you have a question? Sorry. Okay, great. Um, I agree. I feel like this, this should be included. Uh, Long-term Boeing engineer Sam Selfpour went public Tuesday with claims that he observed problems with how parts of the plane's fuse, fuselage uh, were fastened together. Important to include in a summary? Sound, somewhat? The last part, yeah. That's a, that's a good point, not everything. All right, then Selfpour warns that production shortcuts could significantly shorten the lifespan of the plane eventually causing the fuselage to fall apart in mid-flight. Not really. Okay, I, I think I, for me, I would think I would uh, like to know that production shortcuts can fall apart in mid-flight. That seems like a relevant uh, information um, if you are going to fly in the near future, <laughs> which... You know, I was flying last week and I went on a rabbit hole of Boeing's crashes. <laughs> now, if left unchecked, this could result in catastrophic failure, self said Tuesday during a press briefing to discuss his claims. Yeah, it's kind of redundant, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's... And then a spokesman for the FA FAA confirmed that the agency investigating those allegations, which are for first reported by New York Times, but declined to comment further on them. Yes, that's right. So we don't want to have this redundancy, right, in the summary. And but the fact that the federal regulators are looking into this is important. And Boeing immediately pushed back. Yeah, I would agree that yes. Yeah, I mean we we want to include uh, you know diverse perspectives. Okay, so let's not, not go further. I think this uh, kind of brings me to one of these points. So basically what we were doing right now is context selection. We were picking the right content for the summary. And I think what we were all focusing on is relevance, determining what information is most essential and relevant to the main point of the article. And sometimes uh, this is gonna be domain specific. For example, for me, it is important to know uh, which aircraft exactly is having this issue, such as Boeing 787 Dreamliner. That information uh, is important because not all of the potential air aircraft by Boeing have this issue, but this is domain uh, specific. Similarly, if we have, um, I don't know, article about earthquakes, then epicenter and magnitude is really important, whereas maybe these words are not important in other contexts. And then there is this uh, trade-off between brevity and completeness. Um, you know, some information seem like we, we might want to include more and more, but eventually the summary has to be concise, right? Otherwise it's not a summary. And then we kind of disagree on the last part of whether we should include a uh, Boeing pushback against these allegations. But this is also important because when you pre present these summaries and there are multiple perspectives, you don't want to have a bias where you show only a single perspective, which unfortunately many you know uh, news media today that don't really uh, adhere to. Okay, so this is the core part of uh, summarization. But even when we you know pick the relevant um, uh, information, there is a question of how do we present it, and this is called uh, generation. Uh, although it's a little bit overloaded here, you will see in a second, which is basically the act of writing the summary. However, in NLP, there are three different ways you can go about this. The first one is extractive summarization or producing a summary by picking whole sentences from the document. Basically, more or less what we were doing together here, except, you know, I agree with you where when you said I would rather have this part, but not the rest of this sentence. However, in extractive summarization, you pick whole sentences and I picked, you know, four sentences here that I think are representative of this document. Um, another way, which is uh, less popular today, and we won't talk about it much in this lecture, is to basically select sentences, but then compress them. And compression in literature is done just by deleting certain words, which is 
to some extent we were what we were doing when we said, okay, we want a first part, but not the second part. Uh, so here I kind of deleted some of the words uh, from these sentences over here. And the final type of summary is so-called abstractive summary and the uh, act of producing abstractive summaries called abstractive summarization is when you rewrite and re-express the content uh, freely. So here, GPT-4 generated summary is um, Sam Selpur, a Boeing engineer, has made public alleg allegations about assembly issues in the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, specifically regarding the fastening of the fuselage parts. The FAA is currently investigating these claims, which Boeing disputes, asserting the aircraft's safety and structural integrity. Pretty good, right? Like, And this is, to me, nicer to read than having these uh, kind of separate, somewhat separate uh, sentences. Okay, so today what we are going to do is uh, we are going to talk about extractive summarization first, and we are going to see some more traditional pre-neural uh, approaches to this. Uh, to this, We're just going to bring, bring the formulation of those traditional approaches without going into details of how to train them and so on. And then we are going to move to abstractive summarization, and here we are going to uh, focus on some very cutting edge uh, topics. We are going to talk about the, even a paper that's like a week uh, old. All righty, so extractive summarization. Okay, before I move on, are, is it clear the difference between these three uh, types of summaries? Okay, see some nodding. So uh, classic formula uh, formulation for uh, extractive summarization is that given some article and the length budget of keywords, we want to pick some sentences of total um, length that's smaller or equal uh, to K and make a summary. And um, early, earlier formulations of this pick important, yes, the, the diverse content uh, is called maximum marginal relevance or MRR from 1998, where you will do the following. While summary is smaller than k words, uh, you are going to calculate this uh, equation that looks potentially a little bit scary, but there is nothing scary here. So first we have, um, let's, let's clarify the symbols. We have R, which are either a single or mul multiple documents we are trying to summarize, and it comes over here. Then we have DI, that's the i sentence in the uh, documents. And um, we have uh, S to be summary. So what we are trying to find here, we are trying to pick a sentence from sentences that are not yet included in the summary um, that maximizes uh, this function over here. This function is uh, balancing two terms, similarity one and similarity two. Similarity one is the similarity between your sentence and your query. Now, query uh, is not something we introduced uh, before, um, but in a, in a case of summarization, when you don't care about some particular topic, you can uh, define a dummy variable and, um, and then um, you don't have so-called query focus summarization, just summarization. So, uh, uh, make this sentence, uh, this part is about making the sentence similar to some query, and the, uh, which is basically another way of saying this is the relevance of this sentence. And then the second part is may, uh, try to maximize uh, that um, uh, this sentence is maximally different from all others uh, so far, uh, because we want to have uh, diversity. Now, uh, when I see this, um, I'm 100% sure that this is written as two similarities, but here, if you want to maximize similarity, this should be maximizing difference, right? Not similarity. So, oh, I see. Uh, here we have um, negative sign. So negative similarity is um, the same as the distance. So you're maximizing the distance between two sentences. A sentence that you're currently considering for picking for a summary, and another sentence that's already in a summary because the uh, J here is uh, the part of the summary. So this is to enforce the diversity. Okay, 
So once you do that for every single sentence that's not yet included in the summary, you will rank them according to this um, measurement, and then you will pick the one that maximizes this function. And you are going to do that until you reach uh, the length that you are allowed to have, or it's impossible to include any other sentence uh, because you would exceed the allowed length. Okay, so this is a classic formulation, and we'll see two uh, methods that kind of um, are following this formulation. Yes. Yeah, query is, um, you can think, for, okay, we didn't talk about Q query focus summarization, but um, you can imagine that you have, let's say here, the title could be, uh, the headline of this article could be, let's say, a query. And you are looking for all the sentences in a document that are most relevant to this query. This would be query focus summarization. But if you do not want to do this, you can define so-called dummy query um, variable and set it to something like, I don't know, summarize, summarization, let's say. So either you do query-based uh, summarization or you are having some something that's relevant for um, summarization in general. All right, so one method that kind of follows this paradigm is to uh, represent the each uh, sentence, um, the, the document and each sentence in a document as bag of words with a TF-IDF uh, weighting. And um, while summary is, again, smaller than K words, you are going to calculate the score of a given sentence by uh, measuring similarity of that sentence with the document overall. The idea being if this sentence is really, really uh, important, then its similarity with the entire document is going to be high, which is, of course, very limiting, right? It's not, not I mean, now we know way better methods, so this might seem like a, a very crude way to do this. And then uh, you do that, you calculate the score of every sentence in a document, and then you discard all sentences whose similarity with uh, some sentence already in the summary is too high, again, by doing the cosine similarity between a given sentence and sentence in the summary. And the best remaining sentence, so the, the sentence that has the highest score here that was not discarded in this set, uh, in, this, in this step here, that also won't overflow the given length is the one we pick, uh, pick here. Okay, and we, we, with this step, we have been doing uh, the relevance check that the, uh, basically here, um, if we go back, um, here we want to maximize the relevance of a given sentence. And by doing the uh, discarding uh, step, we have been checking that the sentence maxim is uh, different from the other sentences uh, in the current summary. Okay, another, another approach is uh, using um, a broader technique called integer linear programming, which was uh, pretty useful for NLP in general be uh, beyond summarization uh, pre-neural uh, methods. So here we are going to approach the same idea of picking important yet diverse content uh, differently. We are going to count the number of documents each uh, bigram occurs uh, in to measure its importance. Uh, so with the Boeing example, we had only one document. We could have uh, multiple. If I went to not only to NPR, but to other news outlet, I could collect all documents about this uh, piece of information. Uh, and from all of them, I would check which bigrams occur in uh, every single one of them. And uh, this would give me a collection of unique bigrams that appears in this collection of documents. And then I would count how many times each bigram occurs uh, in this collection. And you can think about count. The higher the count of this bigram, the more relevant uh, this bigram is. So we have seen Boeing 787. That would be probably really high bigram in this story because it's every, everything. this whole story is about this specific aircraft. Okay, and then we want to find summary then maximize this, the score of bigrams it covers, right? So here the notion of uh, diversity is um, kind of given implicitly because to maximize how many bigrams you can have, 
in a summary, you need to pick diverse uh, bigrams, right? So diversity is going to implicitly be a um, byproduct of this method. Okay, now I will give you the formulation of ILP. Um, and we, not, we will not go into details how, with, of how to actually train something like this. You will just see uh, one of these um, ILP formulations. Okay, so in this formulation, we need to introduce variables, C and S. Um, these are indicator variables that are indexed over bigrams and sentences respectively. So C uh, is, um, you can imagine it as a, as a vectors of zeros and ones that tells us whether the corresponding bigram um, should be included or not in a given summary. And as well, uh, S has the same notion. It tells us whether a given sentence should be included or not. Uh, and of course, they are connected to each other, right? If you are including a bigram, bigram is part of a sentence, so that sentence should be uh, included. And this is going to come in the formulation. Okay, so the formulation looks a little bit scary, so don't be terrified. Uh, we'll, we'll go over it slowly. So the goal is to maximize uh, this, the, the weighted uh, sum of uh, these uh, indicator variables for the bigrams. So here, this weight over here is the frequency of a bigram in the document. So as I said, the more frequently bigram occurs in a collection of documents, the more important it is, and therefore it's gonna have higher weight over here. And then CI are either zero or one, which tell us whether the i-th bigram should be included or not in the summary. Um, and if I'm not clear, this is obviously what we are looking for. The outcome of this method should be to find right CIs and SIs. That's, that's the goal here. Okay, so we want to uh, maximize this because this sum, weighted sum of the bigrams we are including is basically maximizing the scores of bigrams the summary is covering. However, we need to have a constraint here. The constraint is that we have a budget of, we can have at most K or here uh, capital L words to include. So here LJ is the length of the sentence SJ. And uh, here we are summing over the basic daily lengths of the sentences we are including in the summary. And that length should be smaller than some budget we are allowed. So this is the constraint. And this is not the only constraint because I have said before that if you are including bigram CI and that bigram is a part of the sentence SJ, then SJ must have value one. So these two things have to occur, uh, have a value one together. All right, so this is done by introducing these two, uh, two additional uh, constraints that are over here. Uh, for some reason, the plugin I used to write LaTeX in slides broke uh, for writing uh, the command uh, matbb, which would give me the indicator function I like, which looks like one with another vertical thing. So I used here simple chi to um, indicate for the indicator function. So this means this is gonna be one if ci is the element uh, is bigram that occurs in sentence sj and here as well. Uh, so this is one only if ci is element of sj. So what, is, what this is telling us, if CI is element of SJ, then uh, SJ, which is the indicator of whether SJ is included in summary, so should be smaller or equal to, uh, to CI. Basically, uh, it should, uh, if, if this is zero, this cannot be one. And um, this also uh, tells us um, something, uh, something similar which together gives us uh, this constraint that um, if we want to set CI to one, we can do that if and only if some sentence that contains it is included. So these two constraints give us. So this is our main uh, objective function. And these, this constraint, this constraint, and this constraint are th three constraints for this um, optimization problem. And we are looking for values CIs and SJs 
And we are not going to see how people actually do that. We rarely do this uh, anymore. Uh, but then the outcome of this optimization process would be that you find those values and those values then tell you which sentences you uh, should extract for your summary. All right. Any questions about that? Yeah. So yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's only for extractive summarization because we have these variables that tell us, hey, should you include this or not? In the end, we only care about variables as J, but the whole idea is to focus on bigrams. But in the end, we are not selecting bigrams, rather the sentences. Um, yeah, so here is no rewriting, no deletion, no free expression. Okay, so. There is that, and then as always, BERT came to the scene, and then things have changed since then, right? Uh, so here, BERT form summarization is very, very simple. It uh, just, um, the idea is to check the, how important each sentence in a, in a given document is to include it in a, in a final summary. So this approach, BERT sum from 2019, and all it does, it has uh, multiple classification tokens instead of one. Usually we have only a single one. Here in front of each one of the sentences, we have a CLS token. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this thing is um, the same thing we have always seen. I, I always ignore these uh, segment tokens. I don't, I, they are just not super important. So we didn't talk too much about them, but all of this here is the classic bird. So, um, you know, if, if you don't want to have another visualization of BERT and you had some that you liked before, stick with it. You don't need to now, um, you know, replace it with this one. And here you'll get the contextual representation of each one of the sentences. And then you can use this, uh, you know, CLS token for a given sentence uh, to predict the score of that sentence. And then you select top scoring sentences for your summary. So it becomes, again, very simple. Did, did you notice how these more traditional approaches are very more interesting algorithms and then, then everything turns into something which is, yeah, you've put it in birth and then you use CLS token to do uh, classification uh, with, you know, standard multiplication with one matrix plus self-max, which can be either you're happy about it or a lot of people are disappointed that, you know, uh, something as simple works for so many complex tasks. Okay, so um, how do we evaluate uh, summarization? Um, automatically. Remember, there is no better evaluation than human evaluation, right? That's always the gold standard, but human evaluation means that we need to recruit people, pay them, and make sure that they are doing the task and not just trying to do it quickly to earn money. So in 2004, uh, Rouge metrics was pre uh, proposed. Uh, Rouge N measures the engram precision recall F1 of summary with respect to gold uh, standard, which is a summary written by a human in the same fashion. So if it's extractive summarization, the people are also instructed to produce extractive summary, not abstractive. Does this remind you of any other measurement we have seen before? Yeah, great. Blue was um, basically more or less the same, except that blue focused on precision only. Uh, and while um, Rouge is also measuring recall. Um, and you can think like when we do, uh, when we do translation, then um, it's almost like we are doing one-to-one -one mapping. So recall is not so important. You know that your translation system will have a good recall. So it's, it's less important. Uh, and here, because there is more options of what we can select, uh, then the recall becomes important. So yeah, let's go just over one example to remind ourselves how this works. So uh, Rouge 2 uh, specifically has been shown to uh, correlate somewhat okay with human judgment. So what a good summary is uh, for multi-document extractive summarization tasks. 
Um, and let's let's just work work through an example. Here is a reference summary. When I say reference a summary, is this a generated or human authored summary? Human summary, great. So we have something GPT for generated. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, and then generated summary, which we also use the um, terminology hypothesis summary, for example. Um, reference versus hypothesis is something we had seen um, many times so far. A quick brown fox leaped over a lazy dog. So you call, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, you, you find all the bigrams in the reference summary and you find all bigrams in the goal summary. And then you check which, uh, which of, uh, uh, which, uh, what are the bigrams that overlap. And then um, recall is the number of overlapping bigrams over the bigrams that are in reference summary. So how many of the bigrams in reference summary they are actually presented in your uh, generated summary, which would be three over eight here. And then precision is number of overlapping bigrams um, uh, among bigrams in the gold, uh, in the generated summary, excuse me. So how many of them are actually you know, uh, from those that we retrieved, how many of them are actually uh, in the human author summary, which is also here three over eight. And then the F1 is just the uh, the um, harmonic mean uh, as, as always. And uh, again, do not attempt to implement any of this yourself. There is a, there is a library for you to reuse. It's easy to uh, make a mistake here and the worst thing you can do to yourself is to have a buggy evaluation script because then everything you have later, all the insights and observations are buggy too. Okay, and um, here I, uh, the CNN ma Daily Mail dataset was um, widely used for extractive summarization. It does have many issues and there are better datasets out there, but it has been used to kind of demonstrate the uh, performance of extractive summarization. And you can see, so here on i-axis, we have uh, Rouge 2, and here we have performance over the years. And you can see that here, about here, 2018, 2019, we had um, pre-trained language models. Uh, here, for example, I think some of them would be. And you can see, again, that quick jump from something complicated like ILP formulation to something simple like BERT, where you don't need to have any fancy algorithm, you just put the data into your model, more or, uh, more or less. This also gives you some sense of what kind of performance you should be expecting, right? Uh, maybe you are training your uh, extractive summarization system for the first time in your life and you get some number and you have no idea whether that number is good or not. This kind of gives you an insight of what kind of performance you might expect. But of course, this is new summarization. And now if you're working in a widely different domain, you can expect way worse performance. If you get way higher, that, that, that would be suspicious. OK, any questions about extractive summarization? Okay, so yeah, um, we are going to move to abstractive. And although I said, I, you know, to me, it's easier to read an abstractive summary. Um, a lot of news, news, uh, you know, media online have, uh, maybe you notice like there is a headline and then there are two to three bullet points. Um, this is an example of extractive summarization plus maybe some compression, right? So it's still very much so uh, relevant for the applications of summarization that we have uh, on the web. All right, so abstractive summarization, remember, was about you have a piece of document and now you want to, given that document, just write a summary, but using any kind of expression uh, you want, while being, of course, factual and faithful to the uh, to the given document. So how could we do this now that you, again, you have some knowledge of what kind of techniques might be suitable? What comes to mind here? Yes, exactly. Sequence to sequence. This is a perfect task for sequence to sequence. Our input, to the, uh, this document is going to be the sequence we give as a source. 
and the output is going to be uh, the target sequence. Um, so yeah, there is a literally nothing else we then need to do. The sequence to sequence approach we have seen for neural machine translation, we will do the exact same thing, except now instead of um, instead of having translation data, you have summarization data. You just change the data. Um, of course, the, we've seen different uh, methods for decoding and uh, abstracting summarization. Um, you have more freedom, right, than with translation, uh, I would say. And that means that you might want to have slightly higher values of nucleus sampling or something that would than uh, what you would have for translation or something that you want to be a little bit more, you know, constrained. Um, and of course, there are different ways you can go about sequence to sequence approach. Uh, you can uh, use um, your, you have a data set with human authored summaries, and you can take some suitable pre-trained model like T5. We talked about T5. We didn't talk about these other ones like BART, but there are other pre-trained models you can use. Um, it's important that it's not mask language model, rather a model that's trained for uh, to be able to do generation. So uh, BERT wouldn't be a good model to fine tune for summarization because it's trained to do mask language modeling. So it's usually better for classification as, as we talked way back now. So you can do that. Um, however, these days we have seen instruction fine tuning, right? Like these models like Flenty5 has been pre-trained with the data of 1800 tasks and summarization is one of these tasks. So to some extent, this model has already been prepared to do summarization, maybe not in exact task you care about. Uh, I mean, not exact data set, I should say. So maybe it's trained on news articles and you care about um, summarization of legal documents. So here you can uh, either fine tune it or prompt it. Uh, you can uh, just ask, summarize this document, give a document, and ask the model to complete uh, this uh, prompt. Um, you should be careful. I, I told you this when we were introducing instruction fine tuning. Uh, if you are claiming zero shot performance, then you need to make sure that your summarization data was not part of instruction fine tuning, namely one of those 1800 or more tasks, which is, which is a little bit hard today. For example, there are examples of such models for the data sets that these authors have explored uh, here. But usually today, um, I think there was a time where people cared about zero shot performance, but I would say that um, because it's so hard to really guarantee that something is zero shot, it kind of be it became a, a term that's less used and less, um, important in a way, like, is it zero shot or not? It doesn't matter. It's more like, do you need to fine tune your model, change its parameters, its weights or not? Can you just uh, prompt it and get the completion? All right, now, how do we feel about using blue or rouge for evaluating abstractive summaries? Do you want to say more? Why do you think it's not a good idea? Perfect. Yeah, that's that's right. So you can have a perfectly fine summary. You just decided to rephrase every single, almost all bigrams, and now your overlap with human authored summary will be very low. Um, so yeah. With rewriting and re-expressing, there are more reasonable summaries, way more options than with you know, extractive summarization. And measuring overlap with human author summaries is uh, then is not going to be reliable. And we've seen this same thing with machine translation. And it's the case with any kind of text generation. As soon as you allow some expressivity, it becomes terribly hard to evaluate models automatically. So Human evaluation is to this day the final thing you do, but uh, development of these models, as you have seen in your homeworks, like choosing hyperparameters and all of that, there are so many decisions evolved that you cannot, for every single decision, 
uh, perform human evaluation because that's costly. It costs, um, every, every one of these experiments is gonna cost you hundreds of dollars. So if you have 10 decisions to make, this turns into thousands of dollars. Okay, however, um, there have been some proposals for how to uh, measure the quality of summaries automatically, and we'll go over, over them. Um, these are, the point of going over, over these is to for you to know some better automatic evaluations of text generation. So when you do this intermediate development, you can evaluate them to kind of guide you a little bit about what you should be, uh, you know, changing. But eventually you should, you should do human evaluation. So first one is uh, BERT score. And I kind of skipped this. Uh, the, these new measurements all come to kind of the, the gist of them is the idea of uh, can, we, can we measure whether the uh, reference summary, the human authored one, and the generated one have the same meaning. So we are not anymore focusing just on lexical overlap because it, you can have, as we just said, low lexical overlap and convey exact same uh, meaning. Uh, and you know synonyms are great example of that. So what BERT score is trying is does it represents the reference and generated uh, summaries using BERT's contextual representation. So you put BERT the summary uh, you generated. I mean your model has generated into BERT, and you get one vector that comes from the last layer of BERT, the CLS token one, and you do the same thing from human authored one and you measure the cosine similarity between them. And this is used for many text generation tasks. We are talking here about summarization, but um, you will see BERT score for other generation tasks. Uh, the issue here is that, you know, these contextual representations are not perfect representations of meaning, right? And whether, even if they are, is the cosine similarity in a Euclidean space sufficient to measure that you know, these two vectors convey the same meaning is also the question. So although BERT score is better than rouge and lexical overlap measurements very often, it's not perfect. And you will still see low uh, correlation with human judgments of text generation quality. Uh, that said, it is slightly better and usually people do report it together with uh, rouge. There is also a mover score, which is somewhat similar a little bit more complex, and I guess that's why it's also maybe less uh, frequently reported, which um, it finds the shortest path uh, to conversion between the contextualized embeddings of machine-generated output and its corresponding reference by solving a constrained optimization problem. So uh, the, the idea is somewhat similar, right? You have this contextualized presentation, but we, instead of saying, okay, cosine, uh, cosine similarity can be sufficient to retrieve their similarity, we are looking into a more complex way of measuring uh, the similarity between them. So these ones, um, it's important that the shift here, what happened from rouge to here, is the change from measuring lexical overlap uh, to now working in this dense embedding space as a measuring similarity in uh, representations that we all now know contain more information about the sentence. The third shift has be, uh, occurred when we also try to learn the measurement. Uh, and the most popular example of this is called blurred. Here, the idea is similar to bird score. You want to measure the similarity of contextualized representations, um, but you want to change bird in a way that the similarities you get from these representations is um, the if the if the if there is a high uh, cosine similarity based, uh, from representations, you want to have high correlations with human judgments of quality of um, generation. So you are changing birth uh, to to have what I just said. It was a very lengthy sentence, so I will not repeat it. So you find tune BERT in two ways. Uh, first stage that has shown to be important is that you, they, the authors of the work, they sampled randomly sentences from Wikipedia 
and they perturb them in some uh, ways. Maybe they change synonyms or I, I don't know exactly what they did, but they just have some rules that change these uh, sentences. And now you created a pair of original Wikipedia sentence together with its perturbed version. And uh, they scored each one of these uh, sentences with uh, metrics like blue and rouge. And basically they trained the model uh, to, to mimic the scores of these uh, metrics. So basically they fine tuned BERT such that if you take the representation of the original sentence and perturbed one, uh, the, you know, let's say cosine similarity between uh, the representation of this fine tuned BERT uh, should be um, correlated with the score you would get from the lexical overlap measurements. However, we just learned that this is not enough. So in the second stage, after this, they call it warm-up stage, they use human judgments of translations or in their work, they, they focus on machine translation, but you can do this for any task for which you have human judgments of, uh, of text uh, that's generated. So they take these, uh, whatever translations they have and whatever people have said, whether this is good or bad summary, and they train, uh, train BERT uh, that comes from this stage over here in a way that then the representation of this new variant of BERT, when we do, let's say, cosine similarity uh, between them, the score will be, um, will be um, excuse me, um, correlated with human judgments. So the point here, the overall point here is that now people will say that we learned a metric. So you are changing these BERT representations. You are not using off-shelf BERT anymore. You are changing BERT in a way that when you do something you did with the BERT score before, will be more correlated with human judgments of uh, quality. And finally, there is something called QA eval, where um, this is an interesting idea where idea behind this is, okay, if I have a human authored summary, if I generate questions and, an and answers uh, within this, uh, you know, human authored uh, summary, and then I generate a new summary, I should be able to answer these questions in the context of the generated summary. If generated summary is capturing the same information the human summary had captured. So they do that. They use a model to generate questions from a human author summary and get the answer as well. And then they use some question answering model to answer, they are given the generated summary and they are given the question and then the model, the question answering model needs to uh, answer the question in the context of the generated summary. And uh, the idea being that the accuracy is gonna be higher better degenerated summary is. This one is less frequent. And this one you, I haven't seen in, um, so in a lot of text generation papers, you will see BERT score and BLURT reported. Uh, this one I didn't see in, uh, in many uh, text generation papers, which doesn't make it, um, it doesn't mean it's worse. It just means that it didn't pick up as much as BLURT and BERT score has. So people might expect you to report BERT score and BLURT uh, more often than uh, QA ever. Um, something I didn't put here, I, retrospectively I should have, uh, is that now people are also using GPT-4 where GPT-4 is given the um, human, uh, excuse me, uh, the yeah human authored summary and generated summary and it's asked which one it prefers, one or the other or neither of them. They are both bad or they are equally good. And the and then people report, okay, whether the uh, ideally your generated summary should be on par with human authored summary or even uh, better. However, issue with these is that th this has come to a scene like last year and there has been so many new insights into how this uh, way of measuring uh, quality can uh, fail. Namely, GPT-4 prefers longer uh, inputs. So. Uh, it might see, okay, you're given one summary, another, oh, this one is longer, therefore I prefer it, not because of the actual content of that summary. So people are still discovering what kind of biases GPT-4 has 
when it's used as a as a you know a thing to do preference evaluation. It's still useful, but again, human evaluation co should come uh, after it. And then, uh, if yes, if GPT as a as a you know um, evaluation is highly correlated with human judgments, then you can be more you know optimistic about it uh, in the future. Okay, any questions about these measurements? All right, so remember, uh, if you open, uh, uh, and I, I will have a table from a very recent paper, you will see that people report all of these, uh, all of these things, not just rouge. So you report rouge, bird score, and blur. If according to all of them, your model is generating better summary than, than uh, you know, um, another method, or even better if your human evaluation says so, uh, then you're uh, kind of good to go. Okay, so um, I want to go over a few more recent works. And this work, which has a ni nice title, New Summarization and Evaluation in the Era of GPT-3, uh, which um, in, the, in this work, they had started to notice that these summaries that are generated by these huge pre-trained models are becoming really, really good. So here they have a uh, Brio is, um, I'll go back here. Uh, remember when we talked about sequence to sequence, I said you have basically these three options. One of them is to fine tune a model on a summarization the data set. One is to prompt instruction tuned uh, model. So here, Brio is a method where you are fine tuning a model. And here uh, we have two data sets, CNN and BBC. These are two news um, data sets for news article summarization. And um, in this evaluation, they ask human annotators um, about their preferences between the summaries generated by these three methods. And here you see absolute counts when, let's say, GPT-3 was um, rated as the, its, uh, its summary has been, uh, excuse me, rated as the best among these three summaries 58 uh, times. And only nine time uh, it generated summary that was the worst among uh, these uh, trees. Now, kind of, I think now because you have, you know, been using ChatGPT for so long um, and maybe didn't fine tune models before, you're like, okay, this is maybe expected even. But I, I would say it is interesting that if you fine tune a model using the data, that's sampled from the same distribution as the test data, they are going to get summaries that are subpar to just having a very large language model, you know, generated it by being prompted to do so, which raises some questions about this data itself. You know, um, remember I told you CNN Daily Mail has been a data set that's been shown to have kind of quality issues. Uh, but also it raises the question of, do we need to fine tune models to specialize them, which is a more complex question to answer because if you, um, maybe you don't want to pay API to get summaries and maybe you want to summarize data that's proved that you cannot put into an API. So you still want to have potentially more smaller model that can fit on your hardware and that for which you have weights uh, released and generate summaries uh, with them. So this is what uh, the um, the um, this is th this is the kind of a more aggregated view of this evaluation. And here they break it down in uh, a little bit more. I won't go into details of this, but the point here is that um, uh, uh, is basically what they say here. GPT three is the clear winner according to majority vote. Um, but the, this choice is uh, un, un, oh, I cannot pronounce. Uh, basically, for a, a big fraction of these examples, is uh, there is a disagreement between annotators for that specific summary. So uh, maybe one person will say GPT threes is the best, and then uh, maybe two of them say GPT threes is the best, but then the third one had said I actually prefer prefer uh, Brios uh, among uh, these three. So 
the the outcome of this um, you know breakdown is that uh, what what they say here uh, this demonstrates the inherent variance in different annotators' definitions of best summary, especially when comparing high quality summaries from strong models. Uh, this is important to remember. Like um, we have. Um, you know, talked about lexical overlap, then we kind of boiled the definition of, you know, behind the evaluation into whether these two things have the same meaning. But the, at the end of the day, even human authored summary might not be the best uh, summary according to some person. So what is the, you know, we want to evaluate models, but also we don't know what exactly makes the ideal uh, case, unlike in, you know, uh, um, classification where things are cleaner. Okay, so another uh, table that's interesting from this paper is this one, where they do report this rouge and blue and bird score and mover score and Q eval. However, uh, in, in green, you can see which uh, among these three, four models, uh, Pegasus, Briot, T0 and GPT-3, in green, you see the best the best uh, model according to this evaluation over here, or you know, whatever evaluation we have in the uh, column. And in red, you see the worst one. So all of here, we, excuse me, we see that um, according to humans, uh, GPT-3's um, summaries are the best among the summaries of these three, three models. According to these automatic evaluation measurements, GPT-3 is consistently the worst. And that's what I mean when I say you must have human evaluation at the end of your um, exploration. Because to this day, this paper is from last year, to this day we still see this discrepancy because between what the automatic evaluation of text generation tells us is the best and what people who in the, at the end of the day, we care only about what people uh, like because we are producing these things for people. Uh, if uh, so, if, you're, if your human evaluators say, this is the best one, then that's uh, the best one. Thoughts on that? Yeah, evaluation of text generation is hard. Even with humans, there are so many things that go wrong which is a topic for another day. Um, okay, so let, there are a few more things I want to talk about. Uh, namely, I want to talk about, uh, eventually I want to wrap with factuality and hallucinations that we talked about last time. So uh, this year, um, um, people have started to do things that seemed impossible a while back, which is uh, summarizing a whole book. Um, I cannot describe how wild to me is that we can actually do this to any extent. It doesn't work yet, but the fact that we can even process the whole book with a neural network is, is amazing. So to prompt large language models like GPT-4 to give you a summary of a whole book, you need three prompt types. Um, before you actually deploy these prompts, you are going to split your whole book into chunks that are feasible for your model to process. So um, last week, there has been a new open source model called Command R Plus is great. And it's um, input sequence length, maximum input sequence length. Do you want to guess in number of tokens how big it is? 100,000? it's 128,000. So you can fit 100, 128,000 tokens um, in the maximum input sequence length. Remember BERT could process 512 and that was like 2018. So six years after it's massively extended. So depending on what's the maximum input sequence length of your model, you are going to produce chunks that are basically of the similar size. And then you're going to prompt uh, your model, like let's say GPT-4 or Claude or Command R Plus to summarize each one of these chunks. And this is going to give you a summaries on chunk level or first level. And then you're going to uh, prompt your same model to merge summaries 
of two chunks into uh, now uh, this level. So this summary is the summary of two summaries. Um, and here you also need to pay attention if your chunks are, you know, that you here we have a chunk, uh, excuse me, summary of chunks three and four. So here you also want to, um, your prompt should be condition or provide information of what is the summary of prompts that came uh, came before it. Um, to kind of have a little bit of coherence, right? And this is, you're going to repeat all of this until you have a single, single summary uh, in the end. Okay, so this is how people do uh, summarization, prompt for summarization of entire book. And now hot, hot out of press, this is one week old. Um, here, uh, these authors have evaluated um, summaries of books from produced by all of the you know top uh, models these days. Uh, we have GPT-4. Uh, before GPT-4, we had GPT-3.5 Turbo. Then after GPT-4, there was a Turbo version of it. And then last month, for the first time ever, a model that's not produced by OpenAI has uh, crushed GPT-4 on certain benchmarks and um, uh, certain evaluations. So this is the best proprietary model developed by Anthropic. So it also is a, like a shift in this, um, you know, race for the best large language model, uh, which is very exciting. Also in, in April, and we are only 10 days in April, there have been about, I think, 10 open source large language models released. Uh, one of them is Command R+, which is, uh, now getting closer to these proprietary models. So uh, things have been changing in the last month a lot. But I digress, this was about, oh, what's happening? A lot is happening. Um, so this is the best proprietary model. And um, they had human annotators um, evaluate uh, the summaries produced by these models uh, across many dimensions. One of them is factuality. And here the, the, the big thing to remember is that even the strongest proprietary LLM today uh, produced by corporation that has $4 billion, per, um, four, $4 billion to do this thing is um, their summaries contain factual errors in, over, in almost 60% of their summaries. So this is far from being really, really solved. Um, what's far now when I say that, like maybe in a year, this will be way uh, smaller, but it's it's good to see that, um, first of all, it's nice to see this evaluation. And I want to, um, you know, again, reiterate my, imp like how impressed I am that we can even generate summaries, right? Like, um, uh, so for example, in 0% of Claude summaries, they were vague or repetitive or data influence, whatever that uh, that means. And, and, and in a good fraction of them, they are, you know, what the annotator said, well done. So that's a massive achievement, right? To be able to, with any rate, produce a summary of a whole book that that's uh, not complete rubbish, but there, there is still a way to go to produce outputs that are always factual. Okay, and you know we talked about the hallucinations um, uh, last uh, Monday when we talked about question answering, right? Uh, when we talked specifically about retrieval augmented generation, um, and we said hallucination is a response that's not faithful to the facts of the world. Um, I highly recommend this paper, which also breaks down of what kind of errors these models are uh, doing into uh, a few types that are themselves separated into two uh, categories. So um, it's nice to see that there isn't just one type of uh, error and uh, there is a task of detecting hallucinations of these models and it typically has been done on a binary level. Either there is a hallucination or not and what these authors are proposing, no, let's try to break this down into you know six categories or more of um, what kind of error is actually happening. Um, so there's that. And now, of course, because this is becoming such a big issue, people have in, in NLP research are excited about trying to uh, 
just evaluate the factuality of a generated output automatically. You would think we learned the lesson that automatic evaluation doesn't really work, but uh, we just keep keep going. Um, so this is one example. It's called fact score. Um, and the idea behind fact score is that given a generation here, and this whole work is done only for generating biographies of people. So it's pretty limited uh, evaluation that's been presented in the in the paper, which is fine. Like people start with something and then research is there to to you know broaden the ideas. Uh, here the prompt is tell me a bio of this person. ChatGPT generates the bio. And then this fact score method is um, uh, breaks the generation into series of these uh, uh, so-called atomic facts in this uh, generated output, such as uh, this person is an American or an actress or a model. All of these are mentioned in this actual uh, generation. And um, then each to each one of these atomic facts, uh, a binary label is assigned, uh, whether this is factual or not. And then in the end, you aggregate labels. This is nice because if you had a generated output and your model made just a single mistake, uh, that's better than a model that made um, five mistakes, five factual mistakes, right? And if we have this just binary uh, labels on the uh, level of the entire generation, this is factual or not, uh, both of these uh, examples I've just given would have the same score. But under this evaluation, we get a little bit more, you know, finer grained evaluation. So yeah, this is uh, this is this has been also released uh, very recently. It has been done just for the biographies of people. These decompositions over here are not uh, always correct, so it's not super extremely reliable methods. And NLP research is trying to improve over how to do this automatic evaluation of actuality. So here, there's just some examples of the data sets you might use for these purposes, which uh, as you can see, most of them are from uh, 2024. So uh, not, not older than a couple of months. Okay, and I wanna finish with just one more thing. I mentioned that, um, okay, we have these large language models and can do, they can do the summarization um, pretty good. And it's very you know exciting of what we can then do with all of this, but you might have a situation where you simply cannot use an API or uh, you, know, you, you need to keep your data is on a secure server and you cannot move the data from that server. Maybe that server has only a small GPU, so you can fine tune only very small to moderate size language model. What do you do then? And for that, people have been exploring this idea of distillation where you take the, you train a smaller model by uh, this model trying to imitate the uh, summarization of a large language model. And this has been done successfully. So this is possible. And this is actually how some of the open source models are pre-trained. So for example, Mistral models are, uh, it's not 100% sure the gossip of town is that they taken the GPT-4 generations and then used it to uh, you know, distill GPT's knowledge into, into their smaller open source model. The question of whether this is legal or not is still a gray uh, area. Uh, open AI doesn't want it, but then again, they didn't, you know, respect anyone's data. So I, they don't have a lot of saying, I think, uh, is why they didn't sue everyone around them. <laughs> I'm recording this. I should be more, I hope no one watches this. Yeah, <laughs> except you. Um, all right. So uh, that, that's great. But um, there is this more intriguing result, which is kind of, which is really interesting. And in this work, they have tried to see well, can, I, can, can instead of using, you know, this extreme scale model like GPT-4 level or Claude level, uh, can we start with a small off-the-shelf LM like GPT-2, which is open source? And this GPT-2 itself cannot perform sentence summarization, but we iteratively do something to it. And eventually this model can be used for distilling this knowledge. And they, they show that it can be done if you are doing sentence sentence summarization, which is basically the compression we mentioned, and this is called uh, impossible distillation 
um, which is which is very intriguing, and they present some insights into why this is uh, possible. Okay, so yeah, I want to finish uh, on this, and then next week we are going to uh, do that little, hopefully little uh, exercise where we try to break models with our own languages. So reminder, if you are speaking any language that's not English, come here and we'll write it here on the board. And then um, I'll take a picture and prepare uh, this exercise for the next one. If you speak English only, don't worry, we'll, I'll find something to do uh, that, that you can do as well.